Welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we're so glad you've set aside a few minutes to spend with us today. In each episode of this podcast, we'll share some of what we're learning in the work we do with kids and families on a daily basis at Daystar Counseling in Nashville, Tennessee. Our goal is to help you care for the kids in your life with a little more understanding, a little more practical help, and a whole lot of hope. So pull up a chair and join us on this journey from our little yellow house to yours. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow provides meaningful screen time and shared experiences for families to help you grow in your faith together. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.gominnow.com. Hey, David Thomas. Hey, Sissy Goff. I'm so glad to be back talking about some different things with you. Happy to be back talking with you, too. Except I don't know that either one of us like to talk about what we're about to. <laughs> Patience. We're not good at it, are we? <laughs> <laughs> we're not good at it. We need Melissa's spiritual moment to be really long in this episode because she's way better at patience than we are. Yes, she is. But we're going to try. We're going to do it's our best. Just a reminder to everybody out there, if you're not good at it, we're not either. That's we're right. All we're working all working on it together. Building that muscle together. So if you had to say something that's helping you right now with your patience, what would you say it is? I would say the breathing app on my Apple Watch is helping me a lot to remember to stop and breathe. And it's fascinating to me to notice that it sends me reminders when I'm in these kind of stress, worked up moments. It's fascinating how it's reading my body and reminding me just stop for a moment and breathe. That is so funny. I was thinking the exact same thing. When I was well, I was trying to think of what's helping me be patient, and I'm not sure anything is. But if there's anything right now, it's the same idea. It's just stopping and breathing. Even when I'm one of the times I find myself the most worked up. I wonder if this is a one thing. I wonder if you do this too. I get so worked up in traffic. I think because being in my car by myself is one of the places that I feel like I can get mad because I'm trying so hard not to all the rest of my life. And so I'm like, ah, go, you know. And so I will literally do square breathing on my leg in traffic sometimes, like, sissy, breathe. And it does. It makes such a difference. So I need to be using the app more. I talk with families all the time about that we don't want to just do that in reaction when we're getting escalated, but we want to do it preventatively because that whole idea about how the amygdala enlarges the more we go there, the more the false alarm sounds, the more likely it is to sound. And so you know, practice what you, you preach or the cobbler's shoes, whichever we want, way we want to go with it. But I need to do that more. Thank you for the reminder. You're welcome. Okay. Apps that help. So when we think about kids and patients, in our intentional parenting episode, we talked about how every parent has that one kid. Every parent has that one kid that probably tries your patience the most, and it's often your oldest child of your same gender, or it's the child who's most like you. And we were speaking at a parenting seminar a couple years ago, and I will never forget this because we talked about that very phenomenon. And afterwards, this woman came up to me and she said, I have never heard anyone say that, and I'm so grateful that you all did, because I have a daughter who makes me crazy sometimes. By sometimes, I mean when she's awake. (laughs) And that's true. I mean, there's going to be one child that probably makes it harder for you to be patient than your others. There are going to be some that you have just scads and scads of patience with, but there's going to be one that's your one. And so we want to think about both things in light of that. We want to talk about being patient with them and being patient with yourself because both are equally as important in this journey of raising kids. So I'm going to start talking about one of the things that I think is most important in being patient with kids. And David, I would think this is something you do in your office a ton too. We sit with parents all the time who are describing a lot of behavior. They come in with kind of almost like a laundry list of all the things that their kids are doing in terms of often it's acting out, exploding, sometimes imploding based on what's going on inside of them. But I think one of the first things I always want to do with parents is help them look underneath the behavior because every action of your kids is a communication. 
every time they're acting out, they're trying to say something to you. And so we want to get to the underneath of what's driving that behavior. And I feel like that is especially true for me with kids who are anxious. I will sit with parents and they will say, and we're going to talk even more throughout this season about the amygdala, just like we were, about how they will say they make me crazy and I can't talk them out of whatever it is they're doing. They are in full-blown meltdown, screaming, crying, whatever it is they're acting out. And the longer we talk about it, the more I'll realize that the times those kids are doing that are times of transition or times of unpredictability when they didn't know what was coming. And at that moment, those kids just lose it. And the longer we sit with those parents and talk, because this happens to you too, I'm guessing, David. Yes. Yeah. The longer we sit with those parents and talk, the more we can tie it back to something going on in the kids' laps. And so we want to really pay attention to what could be underneath the behavior. And I think the the helpful thing about understanding in those times is understanding creates more empathy in us. When we can understand the root of the behavior, it will just help us respond with more empathy, which is always really important. I had a family that I was meeting with last week that there is a little girl who just had her first sibling. So she is in elementary school, and they had a little baby boy recently, and she started acting out, which we see happen so often with kids. And her mom was talking about a lot of her behavior and what's been going on. And and what we talked about was how the mom could respond to what she's really communicating in a deeper way more than how she's acting. And so we talked about responding with sentences like, I hear that you're frustrated. I want you to know that you are so important to me. What you say right now matters to me. Or we talked about when she's coming to her mom, whining or getting frustrated, saying, you never spend time with me anymore. He gets all the attention to say, rather than whining's not helping right now, I don't want you to talk to me that way. You know, just responding to the behavior on the surface, saying instead, hey, you know what? I feel like we haven't had any time together in a little bit. I'd love to have some time together tonight after he goes to bed. Let's spend 30 minutes together. Or even proactively coming at what you know their need is in that moment. But we talked about that sometimes even not only are we just treating the behavior, but it can become really manipulative sometimes, and maybe particularly with little girls, that they will act out in ways that we then follow the path of their behavior rather than their need. And so to go to her and say, hey, my guess is right now you feel a little bit like you're not having very much time with me. Let's figure out a time we could carve that out. And then obviously we're still handling the behavior. If it's really acting out, we want to give consequences. We want to go back to that idea of consistency. But we want to think about what's underneath their behavior and how do we respond accordingly. And I think when we're doing that, again, it goes back to a place of empathy and it can create more patience. And I watch that in my office when we'll talk about what's happening at a deeper level in kids, the parents' faces change. Do you see that sometimes too? Oh, yes. Yeah. And so we want to think about what's underneath the behavior. David, what would you add to that? Well, I love when you were talking about that. It reminded me that we can see what's underneath better when we're operating from a place of more full than more empty. And when I think about moving toward the more full, I think it really is thinking about self-care. When we even throw out that word, I'm curious what people's ideas of self-care are, because I think for a lot of parents and moms in particular, I might challenge you in this space. When you think about self-care, you might go to places like a pedicure or a night out, and those might be ingredients or elements of that. But I think even those ideas communicate something extravagant or something I can't quite get around to in ways that I think make it easy to sacrifice the things that you're needing. And so I think it really does start with thinking about what are our primary and secondary needs? That's a lot of what we talk about when we think about self-care. And our primary needs are things like food, water, shelter, and rest, which many of us as parents aren't getting enough of those basic things. We're not getting enough rest. We're not hydrating enough. I talk to parents who are like, I didn't even have time to eat today in ways that make it hard to move toward those secondary needs of things like approval and significance and belonging. And think about it for any of you listening who have 
a newborn, an infant, a baby, or think back when you were in that season, you know, we know that when an infant is crying, that means typically they're either hungry, cold, tired, they need a diaper change. And when we attend to those basic needs, you know, what happens with the infant is that they relax. That's how we know that that need was met. And and what also happens in that exchange is that trust is built. And self-care for us as adult humans is being able to communicate those needs to ourself and taking some kind of appropriate action to make sure those needs are met. And this is how we develop trust and confidence in ourselves, like that we're paying attention to our bodies when we aren't hydrated enough, when we haven't had enough sleep, and how foundational we think that is for parents to really develop before we can be paying good and close attention, like we were just talking about, to what's underneath, to really any of our kids' needs. And so... Two questions we throw out to think about as you think about this idea of self-care is asking yourself with consistency, like, what do I need and what can I do? What do I need and what can I do? And and I think it's connected to the wisdom of, you know, the oxygen mask on a plane that we are told consistently, like, to put ours on first before we can help the kids that we're seated with. And we couldn't anchor you enough to the wisdom of that. And a great tool that you could use individually and then you could be using with your kids as they grow and develop too is one that we love called the Healthy Mind Platter. We talk about it a lot in our offices. This was developed by Dr. Dan Siegel and Dr. David Rock. They define it as seven daily essential mental activities necessary for optimum mental health. They create this design that's like the food pyramid. If you think back to when you were in elementary school and you remember studying the food pyramid, these basic foundational things that we're needing on a really regular basis. And so those are things like downtime and focus time and connecting time and physical time, these basic needs. And so we invite you to jump online and you can find the Healthy Mind Platter pretty easily and use that as a blueprint or roadmap to be thinking about what self-care could look like as you're answering those two questions. What else would you say? you can sit around the dinner table and evaluate as a family. What are the ones we need to work on more? What are we doing well with? I think that's a great conversation starter as a family. I think really the last big picture idea that we would both say so strongly, actually, I don't know if you would say this strongly, David, but I think the thing that makes me lose my patience the most when I step back and really look at it is when I feel like I failed. Would you say that's true? Oh, yes. Yeah. And I feel like I fail a lot. It's part of my oneness, I think. But I I get that in my head a lot. And then I I have a whole lot less patience. You know, we travel and speak at a lot of places in non-pandemic years. (laughs) And I think our favorite comment we have ever gotten from somebody is we had a person who came up to us after one of our seminars and said, Every parenting seminar I've ever been to until this one, I felt beaten up on. I felt like all I heard was what I missed, what I didn't do right. And she said, this is the first one I've ever come to that I feel more inspired than discouraged. And that is absolutely what we would want you all to hear as a result of us having spent this time together, because the reality is you are fallible. (laughs) You're going to blow it, not just sometimes, but a whole lot. In fact, you probably already have today. And so to remember that, to give yourself grace in that, to say also it is never too late to go back and say, I'm sorry. I think there are probably a lot of us who never heard our parents say those words. And those are such affirming, honoring words to say to your kids and such a living, walking example of the fact that we all stand in the need of grace. So to go back to say things like, you know what, I've been expecting you to have more patience, and I haven't been doing so well with that myself, or perspective, self-regulation, even to go back and say, we have really blown it with technology for you, and we haven't done such a great job of protecting and shielding you. So would you forgive me? I'm so sorry. I haven't done a good job with that, and I want to go back and do something different. It's just never, ever too late as a parent to ask forgiveness, to go back and change things, what you can. And 
And I think my favorite example, you all, of this in my lifetime, I don't know that I'll ever hear a story that maybe means more to me in regard to this. So I don't know if you all are like me, but when I was growing up, I had a group of best friends who I think their parents really raised me alongside my parents. And there was one couple that I adored who invested in me so much spiritually, and I just loved any chance I got to sit down with this family. I loved spending the night at my friend's house and getting to talk to them more. And so we will fast forward and... I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. I live in Nashville, obviously now. And I got a phone call not too long ago that this couple, my friend's parents, were coming through town, and they asked if they could take me to dinner. And I was ecstatic to go have time with them as a grown-up. I hadn't gotten to talk to them in years. And so we went to dinner after work one day, and it was so cool. I don't know if any of you have gotten to do this, but it was so cool to sit with them as an adult because I got to hear more of each of their stories than I'd ever heard before because I was a kid when I was around them so much. And so I started learning more about my friend's dad, who I respect so much, already did respect him so much. And so his backstory is that he was married and had four daughters. Then he went through this really terrible divorce, and his ex-wife alienated him from those girls. And then he fell in love with this woman who had a little girl, and he married her and ended up adopting my friend when we were in the fifth grade, which is when I came into their life and started getting to know them. And so he had had this really hard journey with his kids. And I didn't know all of that for a long time. And he started telling me more of that at dinner. And and we were talking about a lot of different things. We were talking about counseling, and we were talking about different opportunities I've gotten to have to speak to parents. And he stopped me at some point and said, Sissy, I want you to know how grateful I am for what you're doing. And I wish I'd had something like Daystar in the lives of my kids and in my life. And he said... To that end, you know, I just think this parenting journey lasts forever. And he said, I have recently really felt like God has been pressing on my heart as a dad. Now, y'all, we're sitting there. I'm grown, and I'm the age of his youngest child, which means he's not just a dad. He's a granddad at this point. And he said, God has really been convicting me. And he said, so much so that I felt like he was prompting me recently to sit down and write each of my girls a letter. And so I did, and I followed really what I felt like he was communicating to me, telling me to do, telling me to say to them, and and it really was to tell him how sorry I was. And so in the letter, I said to each of my girls, I want to ask for your forgiveness. I want to tell you how sorry I am that I was not the dad I wish I'd been when you were growing up. I didn't know you the way I wish I'd known you. I didn't have the time with you that I wish I'd had. I just wasn't around like I wish I could have been, and I'm so sorry for that. And I really do want to ask for forgiveness. And I know I can't go back, but I want to do everything I can now to make it up to you. And so what I want to do is every other year from here on out, as long as I can, I want to take you on a trip, just the two of us. And the first trip I want to do is that I want to come to your hometown and I want to do life with you. I want to spend one day doing what you would do on a normal day of your life. I want to ride in carpool with you, and I want to go to work with you, and I want to meet your friends. And then that night, I want to take you to a really nice dinner, and I want to ask you one question. Gosh, I've told the story 500 times, and it still makes me feel so teary. I don't know if it makes any of you teary, but I just sat there with him thinking, I cannot fathom as a grown woman what it would feel like to have my dad say those things to me. I cannot fathom. And thinking, what in the world was his question? And so I, of course, asked, and he said, I felt like God laid it on my heart to ask each of those girls, what do you dream about? And he said, you know, Sissy, their answers were all the same. I don't have time. This is not my season in life for that, Dad. I'm too busy with my kids. I'm too busy at work. And he said, and I got to sit across the table from each of my girls and say to them, yes, you do. It is your time for that. God is still at this great redemptive work in your life, just like he is in mine. And that's why I'm sitting here with you tonight. 
And what a picture of it is never too late. Even if you're a grandparent listening and you're not just raising your grandchildren, but you want to go back and do some things differently with your kids. And so we would hope that one of the biggest messages you ever hear from us is it's never too late and there is always hope. We serve a redemptive God. And so we can always go back and He is always at this work of taking the places that we have failed and redeeming them in our lives and in the lives of the kids we love. We are so thrilled to be partnering with our friends at Minnow to bring back the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. We all know that devices are here to stay. So if you want to make screen time meaningful for your kids, Minnow is for you. A new streaming service designed just for kids. Minnow has over 2,000 episodes of fun and faith-filled shows that have been carefully curated by moms, dads, and church leaders so it's safe for your family. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.gominnow.com to start your free trial. So let's jump in in light of things we can do differently and talk about some intentional practices. Before I do, though, I want to tell another story that's very different than the one that we just talked about. We have a lot of families that we get to work with together, and we have a family that I just asked, actually, this mom's permission to tell the story, but she makes both of us laugh so much, the mom. And the first time I ever met with her, she came and sat down in my office, and she, bless her heart, I think just had come in with a million things going on, and she kind of threw herself onto my couch, and she said, okay, the first thing you need to know about me is that I have four children, which is entirely too many for anyone. <laughs> Not sure which one she was planning on trading in. And then she went on to tell me this story. It was fall, I think, when I met her. And she said, so the other day, we decided to take our family picture on a Saturday in the fall. And she said, I don't know what I was thinking, because Saturdays in the fall are crazy at our house. And Of course, I was brilliant and wanted everyone to dress alike, and we had this literally this 15-minute window where we were all going to be home at the same time. And so I had the photographer coming then, and she said, you know, everybody had at least three different practices that day, but we, we found this one window. And so I got all of the children together, and by the time we were finally standing together to take our Christmas card photo, one was screaming, one was crying. I was having to do breathing exercises myself. <laughs> and she said, we went to put our arms around each other. And she interrupted herself and said, now you do need to know that my husband is the kindest man on the planet. Sorry, David. And she said, and so we put our arms around each other. And my husband, under his breath, said, I hate our children. <laughs> <laughs> If I were going to say my second block to patience, after being mad at myself, the second would be being in a hurry, Hmm. which leads me to, I love the recovery movement, has all these great sayings and all these great acronyms. One of them is HALT, which is don't ever let yourself get too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, which, you know, we could talk about the healthy mind platter right there, but I think that's really the definition of parenting. So many of you out there are living your life hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, and the theory behind that is when we're in that place is when we blow it and when we make mistakes. And so in light of that, our first intentional practice for this episode would be, seriously, what can you cut out of your schedule? If you were to think about one thing you do on a regular basis that you could let go of, what would it be? Talk about it with a friend. Talk about it with your spouse. Talk about it around the dinner table because everybody could let go of something. Hmm. What would it be? That's so good. David, why don't you give another one? So good. I would say a second one would be develop three self-care strategies that you could start right now, something you could be doing on a daily, consistent basis. And I think it would even be great to think about practices you could do on a daily basis, some practices that you might just do on a weekly basis, once a month, and then even once a year as you're thinking about kind of building a self-care plan for yourself first and then maybe move toward a family self-care plan. But start with just some basics. So can I tell you one of mine? I would love it. I send myself an iCal reminder Every morning with three numbers. 
1, 28. And those numbers will mean nothing to anybody but me. But it's a reminder that I need to breathe for at least a minute a day. I need to move my body for 20 minutes a day, at least. More if I could make it happen. And then the number eight represents I need to try to get eight hours of sleep. I'm a better version of myself when I can do that and drink oh, eight awesome. glasses of water. So 128 wow. every morning, just those reminders. These are just some daily practices I need to be about. I was thinking when you were going over halt so that I don't get so hangry uh, in my <laughs> life, I'm prone to that one. Give us another intentional practice. I would say the last is in light of my dear friend's parents and her dad specifically, what is one area you want to do over in? What's one area that you not only need to ask your kids forgiveness, but you need to forgive yourself? Because that is certainly a piece of it too. I think we hold on to things that God has forgiven us long ago. And we stew in those for a long time. And it doesn't just impact us, but it impacts the kids we love. So what's an area you could get a do-over in? Listening to Sissy talk about do-overs, I'm reminded of a parent group I was with several years ago, and I asked them the question, what do you wish you had known as a parent? And one of the dads said, I wish I had known how much I impacted my children. I wish I had known. And I think that is so true in remembering and how important it is that you do make a difference. Sometimes I think I hear parents say, and I so understand this, I am going to do all I can to have a godly child. But what if we thought about the emphasis being, I'm going to do all I can to be a godly parent? Sissy and I were speaking, and we were on a panel toward the end of this time with an auditorium filled with mothers, And the question came up, would you tell us the secret to making sure our child grows up Christ-centered and well-rounded? The first thing I said was, hmm, sissy? And she gave me the look, like, answer the question, Melissa. And so my answer was, no, I can't tell you the secret. I have a little better understanding and compassion about that right now and just knowing how hard it is and how parents want to know, please tell me, and really thinking there is a secret. I just haven't found it yet. Well, today after listening to David and Sissy, here's a few things that I would say you can do. And again, I'm summarizing David and Sissy. So here we are on the panel. We'll just pretend. Would you tell us the secret to making sure our child grows up Christ-centered and well-rounded? Yes. One, breathe. Two, take care of yourself. And then three, the one that I'm talking about right now is be patient. Colossians 3.12 says, clothe yourself in patience. That's like waking up in the morning and getting dressed and putting on patience. Again, the impact of that. Proverbs 14, 29, it talks about whoever is patient has great understanding, but one who is quick-tempered displays folly. Whoever is patient has great understanding. And I feel like that's so often what children are wanting. Just understand me. Just listen to me. And, of course, it takes patience there. But so often we think patience has to do with just being passive. But in the Bible it talks about calmness, but it also talks about endurance, and it involves perseverance. Eugene Peterson added the adverb in the message, passionate patience. Romans 5.3, he says, We know how troubles can develop passionate patience. Second Peter 1 6, it says, Don't lose a minute in building on what you have been given, complementing your basic faith with passionate patience. And then on in Revelation 3 10, this says, You kept my word in passionate patience. 
And I love that he puts that word with patience. It's a patience with anticipation that I'm looking for something. And parents, you can experience this passionate patience because you are anticipating who your child is becoming, who they are going to be, and going through these stages of development. In Philippians 1.6, it says, He has begun a good work, and He will carry it out to completion until the day Jesus appears. I think that's where you as a parent can claim and begin to experience more passionate patience because it's a patience and a passion based on truth, not on what you do, but to know the truth is, the truth that brings passion to us, that you can anticipate is he has begun a good work in your child. He has called you to be the parent of that child. And so with that, reflect the character of God to your child and how he is like in Psalm 86, 15, he is slow to anger. He's abundant in loving kindness and you desire and you pray to reflect that, the character of God to your child. And then you fail. And this is so important at the end, I want to say, practice patience with yourself so that there is an overflow in the words that you say to your child that I think will impact them in such, such a meaningful way is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And when you say, I'm sorry, and asking for forgiveness, you are receiving forgiveness. The greatest gift there is to receive forgiveness from God so that you can say, and that you're free to say, I'm sorry, instead of being so down on yourself because you fail. And if there's anything that cuts our patients short, it's being down and mad at ourselves. The greatest gift, the greatest gift, again, that any of us will receive. What will create more passionate patience in us? As parents learning to receive, sure, we want you to breathe. That's very important. Take care of yourself, very important. But what will change you and give you more of a heart of patience is to receive and experience the patience of God as he says, I love you. I called you. You have been called to be the parent of Joe the parent of Susan, the parent of Amy. And as you parent your children, your father is oh so desiring to offer you the gifts every day of forgiveness so that you can say with confidence and freedom, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow helps you make screen time meaningful for your family with shows kids love and values parents trust. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.g-o-m-i-n-n-o.com. It's our joy to bring the experience and insight we gain through our work beyond the walls of the Daystar House. Join us next time for more help and hope as you continue your journey of raising boys and girls.